we are talking about rebuild. Are you excited about that this morning? Good morning, good morning. Well, I don't know about you, but if you were sleeping, that would have woken you up, right? We're talking about rebuilding. We're looking at the life of Nehemiah, and I hope that you are as excited about today's message as I am. Uh, some of you are like, yeah, we've got to come to church. And some of you are like, sure, can't we just stay at home and sleep after that rugby? <laughs> So I want to say well done to all of you that made it here today. I do believe that God has got something really, really good in store for us. And when we started planning this message series on the life of Nehemiah, we knew there were some really, really good lessons. And as we've been digging into it deeper, I've just found so many practical ways that we can apply it to our lives. And I'm going to share some of those with you today. And I hope that you're going to find them inspirational and helpful. So we've looked at the call that Nehemiah faced, the crisis, we've looked at construct how he physically was going to build, and we've been looking at how does it apply to our lives. And today, the title for the message is Capital. Capital. So for those of you that are thinking finance, yes, we are going to talk a little bit about finance, but capital is so much more than finance. We're going to be looking at how capital is needed and what God can do when we put capital in his hands. So let's start off with the question of what is capital? And it links to a more important question of what is really valuable to you? Because capital, if you're thinking just finances, finance people will tell you it's important to build up capital. If you're talking to business people, they're going to tell you that you need capital in order to grow capital and have working capital, right? But capital talks about what is really valuable. And I want to ask you, what is really valuable to you? I think it ties in with the, the um, encouragement that Tendai gave us to actually be grateful. Because when we're grateful, we're actually tapping into what it is that we value most. And I would guess that for most of us, money is not the main thing that you're grateful for, right? Capital talks into so much more. So let's have a look at what a definition of capital is. Capital, by definition, is wealth in the form of money or other assets owned by a person or an organization or available for a purpose, such as starting a company or investing. So in our context, it's the capital that we as a community have as a church. In Nehemiah's context, it was the capital that he could draw on so that he could complete his building project. And capital, as I've said, is not just financial. Financial capital can also be called investment capital. That's financial assets or economic resources or a business or an organization. They are physical and financial resources, right? We've got an amazing tech system. We've got a production room. We've got some practical assets. We've got building assets. But just having a building alone is not going to get us where we need to go, right? There's also human capital, the people. If you think about a business, Having the right people in the right places, it's what's going to really build or grow a business, right? There's also intellectual capital, the knowledge and skills and know-how to know how to do it. It doesn't matter if you've got willing people and you've got money. If you don't know how to do it, you're not going to win, right? I think if you consider the Springboks victory last night, there's also reputational capital, right? We can go anywhere in the world and say, we're a part of the nation that won the 2023 World Cup Rugby, right? And I think um, cricket is next on the horizon, right? There's reputational capital there. There's social capital is the network of relationships among people who live and work in a particular society, enabling us to function effectively. So I want to give you an example of how capital is not just money. So Many of you know that Pastor Johan and I come out of a business background. What you don't know is the stresses that some of us experienced as we were doing that. So we were newly married, and the company that he was working for, which was a flooring contracting company, quite a large one, they closed their doors. No retrenchment packages, just, uh, sorry guys, there's no business next week. Good luck. It's like, oh, what do you do? And so the second time that that happened... We sat down and we said, no, we're not looking for another job. We're not going to put our fate in somebody else's hands. We're going to start our own business. And we had a look at some of the principles that we're going to look at in a moment. I'm going to give you seven principles to achieve a goal 
that you want to achieve. And so in our context, we wanted to start a business, but we needed capital. We had a house, we'd only had it for a year, and so we had a tiny little bit amount of savings in our bond and in our personal savings. I think we had something like 12,000 Rand. We're like, okay, you can't start a flooring contracting business like that because the companies that he was used to working for had big warehouses, warehouse managers, receptionists, admin people. We didn't have that. We only had 12,000 Rand, but that was because we were only looking at money. What we did have was social capital. He had a client base. He had relationships with suppliers. And so we took that little bit of capital and we went and literally, it was a cash, one job to the next. We've got enough to buy the material for this one. And then you pray like crazy that the client is going to pay you today so that you can do the job tomorrow. It didn't take long. And the suppliers were able to give us 30-day accounts because there was relational capital, there was trust. And so we were able to build that business over more than 10 years and we were able to sell it as a thriving business that had a receptionist and a warehouse manager and a warehouse and all of those things. But that wasn't what we started with. And sometimes when we look at what we're starting with, it looks like it's not much, right? But when you put it into God's hands and when you use God's principles, God can make it grow. But we've got to have a look at what capital we've got to start. As a church, we've got a really big vision of what we believe God wants us to do as a community. And that's the reason why we are doing this vision series. It's so that once a year we take a moment to stop and say, hang on, what are we trying to build? Why are we trying to build it? And that most important question, what is truly valuable? What is valuable? Because otherwise we run the risk of spending a whole lot of time and energy developing something that's not actually of value or something that's somebody else's agenda, right? We need to answer that question. What is truly valuable? And so if you haven't yet received your rebuild books, they will be available on your way on exit. Maybe you've lost yours. You're welcome to take another one. We've got these rebuild books to help you see what we believe God has called us to do together as a community. And in the center you'll find the different series and topics for the, for the sermon series. And I want to encourage you, this is not just to let you know what's up ahead and to let you know that we are good at planning. Don't you think we're pretty good at planning, though? <laughs> right? There are eight of them. How about you take these, and on Monday you pray into the first one, and on Tuesday you pray into the second one, and on Wednesday you pray into the next ones. Let's take some time and really get into what we believe God is saying to us as a community. And we're looking at what God has called us to do. And today in particular, we're focusing on capital and how we need to do that. So now I'm hoping that today there are some people that are here for the very first time. And up until now, you're thinking, oh my word, who are these people and who's Nehemiah? And so for those of you that are visiting us for the very first time, welcome. I'm going to give you a quick crash course into who Nehemiah was. And those of you that know this already, see how well I do see how many of the key points I cover. So starting with big picture of the Bible, starts in Genesis, God gives a promise to Abraham. He says, I'm going to make you into a special nation to show the world what it looks like when people live in covenant with him. And so we see through the Old Testament how God goes with Abraham. We see with Moses, takes the people out of Egypt. They establish the nation of Israel and they establish some good kings. We see the highlights with David and Solomon. But we also see the prophets, and boy, do the prophets have a lot to say. If you get stuck in the prophetic books, don't get lost. Keep coming back to the big picture. The prophets essentially said, be careful. Make sure that you're focusing on what is truly of value, your relationship with God. Because if you don't prioritize that, God says, I'm going to take the rest away from you. And we see those terrible, terrible times where the kingdom split and they had bad kings and they got into idol worship and the prophets threatened to say, if you don't follow God's ways, he's not going to keep you as a nation. He's going to send you into exile. And then comes that terrible day near the end of the Old Testament where they were taken away into exile in Babylon. They had to serve the Babylonians as slaves and servants. And we see the stories of Daniel and Esther in that time in captivity, far away from home, where they've lost their homeland and they're slaves. And then, remember God says these promises, he will keep his promises. He says, if you turn back to me, I will restore you. 
and we see the incredible turn of tables as the Babylonians are conquered by the Persians and they have a new king, King Cyrus, who comes in and he says, hey, I'm not following the Babylonian agenda. You don't have to stay here anymore. They had been in exile for 70 years and he says, you can go back to your hometowns, which sounds like a really great plan, but can you imagine for a moment if you were one of those moms or dads packing up, you've lived there for 70 years, right? Now you've got to pack up everything. It took them some time. And there were four waves as they returned. They were led by Ezra and Zerubbabel, and then came Nehemiah as the fourth wave of people returning back to the nation of Israel. And what they were returning to was decimated. When they were conquered by the Babylonians, they literally ripped the stones out of the walls. They broke down the temple. They took everything of value and they just left rubble. And so they went back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of God and they wept. And they said, this is a huge job. Things are in ruins. And I think that's a little bit how I feel when I look at our nation and I see that there are so many areas of our society that are not what they should be. Some of them need to be rebuilt. Some of them need to be built. And so in their day, they were looking at Jerusalem. In our day, we're looking at what God wants for us as his people and what he wants for us as a community. And you can see that in the story of Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah, I love him. He's so practical. He says, what's the main problem here? And he said, they don't have a wall around the city of Jerusalem, which means they didn't have an identity. They didn't have protection. We know all about that living in Joburg. You want to make sure that you've got a decent wall so that you know that the right people are inside and the wrong people are outside, right? And so he wanted to rebuild the wall. And I love this verse. Those of you that are taking notes, it's not on the Version Bible app, so you can add this into your notes. In 1 Peter 2 verse 5, it talks about God's picture for us. He says, you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. Each one of us are called to be living stones. He wants us to be rebuilt into his spiritual temple. In the Old Testament, it was the physical nation of Israel. In the New Testament, it is a spiritual people, a spiritual nation, a kingdom that belong to God. That's who he's building. And when you're building lives, it usually goes together with physical buildings, right? When you see a new area that's being developed and you see a new townhouse complex going up and a new school and a new hospital, they're not building buildings for building's sake, right? That means that there are people that are going to live there, that are going to go to school there, that are going to need a hospital. And it's the same with us as a church community. We're going to build lives, but we also need to build physical buildings which are a reflection of what God is doing in our community. A little bit later, I'm going to share you some of the pictures of the progress that we've made over the last couple of years. God is building this community. It's so exciting to see what he's doing. But if you have a look at the picture of Nehemiah's story, I don't believe we're there yet. It says that they got knee height and then halfway until they finally built it to the full height. And we're part way through the building process of what God wants to do in our community and in our world. And so, what are we building? What are we building? We are building buildings so that we can build lives. We're equipping ourselves so that we can be effective in reaching the people in our community. And this time of the year, we take the month of October to focus on what is our vision as a church so that we can be clear on our vision, so that we don't get distracted, so that we don't lose momentum. For some of you, you see this symbol every time, but we don't always think about it. What does it mean to create a legacy that will empower the next generation to be effective in God's kingdom tomorrow? That's what we want to do. We want to create a legacy. We want to be so effective at building and rebuilding that it's going to impact our children. They're going to see how to have good marriages. They're going to see how to run their finances with excellence. They're going to be inspired to run business as well. We're going to help them and protect them from harm. And we're also going to make space for those who get battered by what goes on in the world 
and help them have a place of safety to come and rebuild and be healed. That's what we are building. We want to create a legacy. And the practical way that we measure it, we've called it 5, 10, 15, 20. And this is a five kilometer radius. You can have a look at the map in the passage. A five kilometer radius around our church, a 10 year period, 2015 to 2025. And we're eight years into that process. We want to reach 15% of those under the age of 20. And I've got good news for you. We're making progress. And I've got bad news for you. We're not there yet. We've got over 30 schools in our five kilometer radius. We've got good relationships with five. And that's great that we've got good relationships with five. But what about the others? There are so many young people in our community who will not hear the name of Jesus unless we reach them with it. They're not going to get it in schools. They might not get it at home. They need to be reached with the kingdom of God. And so we want to create a legacy that is going to make a difference. And so once a year, we refocus on the vision, and we also take up a once a year vision offering. And this vision offering is separate to our normal tithes and offerings. It's a once-off amount that we use to build in a practical sense, to put towards buildings, to put towards infrastructure. And I want to say a big thank you to every single person who tithes faithfully, who gives generously. We really appreciate partnering with you. And I want to ask each one of you to consider a once-a-year, once-off donation towards our vision offering. Some of you are thinking, okay, that's why those envelopes are on the seats. <laughs> and I want to just tell you, it's okay. Some of you have come prepared to give today. Some of you haven't, and that's okay. I'm going to explain to you a little bit later what we're going to do with these vision and giving envelopes. So if you haven't brought any money with you today, you can take a deep breath. It's okay. But we're going to talk about what vision offering is about and why we do it and how to do it. Is that okay? You're all still with me. So I want to give you a couple of practical examples of the ways that Pastor Johan and I have participated in vision offering in the last couple of years. We've had the privilege, one year, to receive inheritance money. And it was such an exciting time to be able to give a significant portion of that inheritance money to go, wow, we've got spare to give. And I'm hoping that there are some of you here that have got spare to give, or maybe you've been saving up, and that's fantastic. But that was only one of the years. There were several other years where we had a very different story. One of the years, what we did is we went and we had a look at our savings. We keep our savings in our access bond, and we had to think about it very carefully, and we decided to take a large amount out of our savings in our access bond to put into the building fund because we said we believe that what we're building here is of value. What is valuable to you? That's where we need to invest. Another year, we had nothing to give. And when I say nothing, you guys think it's bad that you've got nothing. You must know how bad it is when you're the pastors asking for the money and you don't have anything to give. And we sat down and we said, what are we gonna give? We're asking our church to give. What are we going to give? And we had a look at what we had, and we said, you know what? We don't have cash, but we do have assets. And I didn't suggest this. Pastor Jay suggested it. He said, you know what? I think I need to sell my motorcycle and give that into the vision offering. Now, have we got any guys in the house? Any motorbike enthusiasts? <sighs> it's not easy to give away your pride and joy baby. But it's not just that. What it meant for us as a family is that we went from two vehicles to one vehicle. That meant that instead of him having his fancy, glamorous, he had a really nice Suzuki Boulevard. <laughs> instead, he's got to share my mommy car, which at that stage always had kids junk in it, right? And the two of us had to share a vehicle. We decided as a family that that priority was important to us because we knew what was of value. It was quite funny. Some of you might remember that. He decided he was going to do a grand entrance. And so you know that sound of that brum, brum, those motorbikes? He literally drove it into the, <laughs> into the church and parked it in the front to say, this is what I'm giving for vision offering because I believe what God is building here is of value. What is valuable to you? 
What is valuable to you? I remember the very first time I ever heard the concept of a building or a vision offering. I was in my early 20s. I had just started my first job and I joined a church that was growing and dynamic. They had planted a church similar to what we've done, planted a new campus, and the new campus property didn't have a building. We only had enough money to do the slab, the the foundation, and we had the service on the slab. They got chairs and they put up a tent and we literally sat on the concrete. We had the service on the slab and they explained about their plan to build a church. And I sat there very smug. I'm like, no, it's my first job. I don't get very much. I'm still at home. I don't have any money. And then God spoke to me and said, um... What is of value to you? Have a look at that salary you're getting. I was like, Lord, I've really not got much spare here. I'm still paying off my student loans. And God said, have a look, have a look. And they suggested a pledge amount. And I looked at the calculations and I thought, you know what? A hundred rand a month is not going to make a huge difference in God's kingdom. But a hundred rand a month times 12 is over a thousand rand. And I was so excited to fill in my very first pledge to say, I'm going to put a hundred rand every month and I'm going to give a thousand rand into building that building. And you can ask some of my friends and family, whenever we drive past that building, I'm like, that's, that's the church that I helped build because I was part of that process. I'm not sure what God is prompting you to do, but I do know that God has got a very clear message. What is of value to you? What is of value to you? And how are you going to be part of this year's vision offering? And when you stop to think what is truly of value, I think a question that I ask myself is, where would I be without the church? I could tell you where my life was heading. I can tell you where I could have been. I can tell you where some of my friends that started life's journey with me are now. Without the church, I would not be where I am today. I wouldn't have the healthy marriage I've got. I wouldn't have the thriving young men in my home that I've got. I wouldn't have a home to live in without God's principles and without God's church. What is truly valuable to you? Today, as I was thinking what is of value, I put on my new sneakers. You like my sneakers? (laughs) I've envied people with vans for a very long time about nearly 10 years. And then when I got a a birthday gift, I was like, I'm going to get my vans. I'm going to join the sneaker club because it seems to have value for a lot of people, right? Maybe it's your jewelry. Maybe it's your car. Maybe it's your home or your business. Often we insure things that are of value to us, right? But sometimes we put our value on things that only give a short temporary pleasure. And we don't invest in things that are eternal value. The numbers that really matter are numbers like how many children do you have, right? We're still counting, but we're counting something different. What is truly of value to you? The fact that you're here in church today is an indication that you recognize there's more to life than just work and possessions, right? Maybe for you, an important value is relationships. And I want to say we share that value. That's one of our core four values. And that is to get connected. Maybe you want your life to be significant. That's another one of our four, to make a difference. Maybe you're not too sure about where you're heading and what's of value. And I want to invite you to come and discover purpose. The way that we discover purpose here at Church Alive is through growth track. Many of you have done growth track. Give me a wave if you've done growth track right? Most of you, right? If you haven't done Growth Track yet, I want to invite you. We're starting Growth Track next Sunday, 10.30 in the cafe. Come and join me. It's a four-step process, and we're going to be talking about our four core values. Know God, get connected, discover purpose, and make a difference. Come and join me, and let's see how we can partner together to make sure that you discover the purpose God has for you. We need to be clear on what really has value. And so when I was preparing this and I was thinking, what is really of value? I thought, I cannot have a sermon only about Nehemiah, and we will get back to him in a moment. We do need to mention the thing that is most important in the Bible, and that is Jesus, right? What did Jesus say is of value? 
So quick pop quiz. Are you ready? Take a moment. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, what do you think Jesus has said is the most valuable? Come on, take a moment. Connect with the neighbor. All right. Some of you looking a little bit puzzled. Some of you looking very smug. You think you got the answer right. I'll give you a clue. It's in Luke 12. We're getting there. And as I unpack this, let's see how close you were to what I think Jesus valued. One of the things that Jesus talked a lot about was money. Did you know that Jesus talked a lot about money? And that bothered me a little. I was like, why did Jesus talk so much about money? And then I found out why when I was preparing this. It wasn't because Jesus was so hung up on money. It was because people kept asking him about money. Because we seem to value money. And so the context for the passage I'm going to read for you in a moment in Luke chapter 12 was a guy who came to him and he said to him, Jesus, will you tell my brother to split our inheritance and give me some money? So he came to Jesus and he's like, here's a teacher. He can get my brother back on track so I can have some money. And so Jesus said, come, let's talk a little bit. And he told a story. It's called the parable of the rich fool. And he said to this young man who was only worried about the money for the here and now, he said there was a rich farmer, successful farmer. And he was so successful that he had such huge crops that he couldn't contain it all. And so he sat down and he decided, I'm going to tear down my barns that are too small and I'm going to build bigger barns to contain all that I have because I'm so important. And God spoke to him and said to him, you fool, because tonight you will die and your life will be demanded of you. And have you invested in what is truly valuable? This is what the words of Jesus say. Jesus said, beware, guard against every kind of greed, because life is not measured by how much you own. Life is not measured by how much you own. And don't we sometimes do that? We measure how well we're doing by how much we own, by whether we've got sneakers or not. Right? Life is not measured that way. Do we have our value system right? And he goes on to say in verse 21, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Before you think it's saying something and it's not, it's not saying that you're a fool to store up earthly wealth. There's no full stop there. It is wise to store up wealth. God wants us to be successful. He says when we put his principles in place, he will bless us. But there's a but, a contrast. It says you're a fool if the only investment you're making is earthly wealth and you don't have a rich relationship with God. I love that word, a rich relationship with God. Not a save me relationship with God. A rich relationship with God. That's our first of our four values, is no God. That is where our true value should lie. And he goes on later on to say, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all his righteousness, and God will add everything else to you. Did you get the answer right? What is truly of value in Jesus' economy? He says, a rich relationship with God. And so I want to give you seven steps for success so that you can make sure that you achieve what is really, really important. I'm going to go through these quite quickly, but I want to encourage you to take these steps and apply them in at least one area of your life. They're quite universally applicable. Maybe you're a student, you can apply these to your studies. Maybe you want to revitalize your budget, you can apply this to your money management. Maybe you're doing a building project, you can apply this. Maybe you're wanting to do a relationship goal. You're looking at your family, maybe your marriage or your relationship with your kids. You can apply these principles so that you can see what you want to achieve and how to achieve it. Are you ready? Number one, start with... Vision. Vision. What do you really want to achieve? The clearer you can get your vision, the easier the other steps will be. Don't be vague. Don't say, I want more stuff. That's vague. 
be clear what the vision is that you want. Be clear. The clearer you have your vision, the clearer you'll be able to articulate how to get there. And that's one of the reasons why we put pictures in our build book, is to give you a picture of where we want to go. And I don't know if you noticed, but our picture is an auditorium filled with people, hands raised, rich in relationship with God. We're not building buildings for people's sake. We're building buildings for lives' sake, so that they can have a rich relationship with God. We need to be clear on what it means and how do we create a legacy. So get a vision. Get a clear vision of what you want to achieve. Step number two seems really obvious, but step number two is the difference between success and failure. Step number two is start. Start. Don't procrastinate. Start. Do something. For most people, the way that you start is maybe to write down an action plan or do some research or to find out where you're at. We need to start. Before you start, a vision is not a vision, then it's just a dream. As soon as you take that first step and start, then you've actually, you're on step two of the pro process. And your first question that you need to start with is, where am I now? Maybe your vision is to get from here to a place you've never been to before. You want to use your GPS. You've got to know where you are. What do you have? Like when Pastor Jay was, was starting that business, we need to know what do we have and what don't we have? What could we have? How do we get from here to there? We need to start. You need to know what your strengths and limitations and obstacles are. You need to start. The third thing, which is the main topic of today's sermon, is resources. What are your resources? What are your options? Do you have finance capital? Do you have relationship capital? Do you have know-how? Do you have skills? What are your resources that you can use to achieve your goal? Right? Step four, you need to have goals. Goals. Now, you need to set measurable goals, which include who, what, when, why, and how. Set practical written goals. If it's in your head, it's not a goal. It has to be on paper to be a goal. That's why we printed this on paper, right? To make it into a goal. And here's a really handy tip. If it's not 100% in your power, it's going to be a very frustrating goal. I'll give you an example. One of the goals that I initially thought I had for my marriage is to have a good marriage. And then I read a book that changed my mind. I cannot have a goal to have a good marriage because it's not 100% in my power, right? I can have the goal to be a fantastic wife, but I cannot have a goal to have a good marriage because Pastor Jay's got to give his part too. It's the same with parenting. We went through a very frustrating t season with teens. We'll tell you some more about that another day. <laughs> I couldn't have as a goal to have a good relationship with my teenage kids because they've got to participate in the process, right? But I can have as a goal to be a fair and kind and wise parent. I can equip myself with wisdom and with skills, and I can make sure that I'm fair and that I'm consistent. I can measure that. Whether they respond to it well or badly is outside of my power, but I can make sure that I have done my part of the goal. Does that make sense? Have clear, written down goals. Then number five, this is the one that some people bum out on, and that is to measure. Measure it regularly. If you've got a goal for your budgets, right, you know, I want to make sure that I'm spending less than I'm earning. What we do is we have a WhatsApp group because we know that we're on WhatsApp all the time. And then we put the amounts on the WhatsApp, and then we do minus, minus, minus. And then you can see, oops, we're getting a little bit too close to the edge, right? We've got to measure it. And then sometimes I'm tempted to say, I'm a pastor. God will provide. <laughs> and then I remember, oh, yeah, I've got to be accountable. I've got to measure my goals. I've got to write it down. Make sure that you're measuring it regularly, whether it's weekly, daily, monthly, once a year. That's part of why we do vision, is to measure how are we doing. One of the goals that's outside of my power but which is one of the things I would hope to achieve, is to have people that are thriving in their relationship with God. And part of that is to have people who attend church every Sunday. 
I've seen it over and over again. When people come every Sunday, they grow in relationship with God. They grow in their knowledge of the Bible. They grow in relationships with one another. They grow in worship. And I see them thriving. And then I see other people who come every now and again. I see some people who only come once every three weeks when their serving team is on. And it breaks my heart because I know that that's going to limit their growth. So I want to encourage you, come every Sunday. Make that a goal for you, to be in God's house every Sunday. That's what God's word indicates. Make it a goal so that we can grow in our relationship with God. So we need to measure it weekly. We measure attendance weekly. You need to measure whether it's weekly or monthly or once a year. Measure your goals. And then my favorite one of the seven steps, celebrate. Celebrate. When you've achieved something, celebrate. The gym companies know this, right? If you come a certain amount of time, they'll give you a free smoothie or they'll give you fitness points or whatever, right? Because when we reward ourselves and we stop and celebrate, we're more likely to have energy to go further. And we've got so much to celebrate. I'm going to show you a feedback clip in a moment on some of the things that we are celebrating from the last year. Celebrate. And then number seven is so important. We keep need to do step seven until we die. <laughs> step seven is next steps. We want to go through these steps. We're going to achieve something. And then we're going to say, what's next? What's next? As long as you've got breath, what's next? That word, that phrase, is actually the key to discipleship. When you're walking with Jesus and say to him, what's my next step? What's next? For some of you, it's attending growth track. For some of you, it's getting water baptized. For some of you, it's joining a life group. For some of you, it's tithing. For some of you, it's actually raising up another leader. For some of you, it's signing up for Christian Leadership College next year because God said, I've got, I want to do more in your life. What's your next step? It applies to whichever principle. So do you like those seven steps? Are they helpful? Can we quickly see how they apply to Nehemiah? You're all still with me. Just wiggle a little bit. We've been sitting for over half an hour. Your bum's numb yet. Okay, those online people, no, you can't go for a coffee break. We're not done yet. Just pause and come back. <laughs> All right, are you ready? This is how it applies to Nehemiah. Number one, vision. He had to have a clear vision of what he wanted to achieve. And he shared that with the king. And this is what he said when he shared it with the people. He said to them, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. The walls were not a, an end in themselves. They were a means to an end. He was rebuilding walls to remove their disgrace, just as we are building buildings so that we can build lives. And then it says, I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. And they replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. And so they began the good work. And that's what I'm hoping you guys are going to say, yes. Yes, I see the vision. Yes, I want to be part of it. That's why we're sharing this vision with you. Number two, start. Where do you start? How do you start? And this is how Nehemiah started. It says, so I arrived in Jerusalem, and three days later, I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. And then it says that he went to inspect the broken walls and the burnt gates start. And sometimes it can be discouraging when you start. It's easy to just keep it in the dream phase, right? But when you go and start and you have a look at the broken down walls, at the burnt gates, he only took a few people with him. And I want to ask you, have you had the courage to have a look around at our community? Have you walked through our schools have you walked through our shopping malls? Have you gone to some of the places where the homeless people live? It's heartbreaking, just like with Nehemiah, to see the devastation. When we stop and we look at the statistics, sometimes it can feel overwhelming to say that our country looks like it's in really bad shape. It can be tempting to say, this is too big. I can't do it. And yet he had to trust that the vision God had given him 
is going to sustain him through the process of starting. And he shared it with a few people to see where are we at now. And for some of you, maybe you're in that space right now. Maybe you're looking at a marriage and going, this marriage is ruined beyond repair. I want to challenge you to walk around those walls with God's vision in your heart. Maybe your finances are looking charred and obliterated. Have a look, take stock and start and ask God what is his vision for your finance, for your family, for your home. Just because it is devastated does not mean it's the end. I believe it is only the beginning. And just take a few close people with you. Don't tell everybody. Just a few people when you start to say, this is where I'm at. It's broken. And then start to put those goals and action steps in place to head towards what you believe God wants to build or rebuild. God wants to do it. What do you believe he's wanting to build or rebuild in your life? in your home, in your community, in your ministry? What is it that you're looking at and you're thinking, there's so little to work with. And God says, watch me, watch me. Just like Nehemiah built those walls, not just halfway, to full height. I do believe God wants to rebuild in your lives, your finances, your homes, your families, your businesses. God wants to build. He wants to do it. Step two is to start. Step three is the resources. Resources, money, assets, social capital. Do you know what Nehemiah was working with? He had very little to work with. He had charred stones to work with. We would call it rubble, burnt rubble. And we know that because the voice of his enemy, Sanballat, describes it like that. And I see that, and you're going to learn some more about this when we get to the, to the um, conflict sermon. Don't miss that one. It's coming soon. Sanballat was his opposition. And we need to be aware that we have an enemy, and he's going to come with the words like the words of Sanballat. This is what Sanballat said. Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. And so he flew into a rage and he mocked the Jews. Are you feeling mocked? Standing in front of his friends and the Samaritan army officers, he says, what is this bunch of poor feeble Jews think they're doing? Do you sometimes feel like that's what your enemy is saying? What do you think you're doing, poor feeble idiot? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices, by just going to church, by by just doing a few courses, by just going for counseling? Do they think they can rebuild? Do they actually think they can make something from stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? The interesting thing about stones, charred stones, they look broken down. They look worthless. But underneath the ash, there are still strong stones. And I believe that we've seen many lives going through some fires. Maybe it's a marriage fire. Maybe it's a finance fire. Maybe it's a ministry calling fire. But the beautiful thing is, is that the fire refines. The fire burns away the things that shouldn't be there. And what is left stands God can build with that. He wants your faith to be those strong stones that we're building with. And so don't let yourself be intimidated when the enemy says, what's that? Charred rubbish, rubble. No, those are the stones that Nehemiah and his team built with, and they built a strong wall. In the same way, I believe some of us are looking at our resources and we're going, I don't have much money. I don't have much to give to this vision offering. And I want to tell you, even if it looks like charred stones, each one of those stones added to the wall. And when each of us come together and we each bring our part, we can build a wall together. And this is what it says, Nehemiah said. I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding the wall. 
Was it by Nehemiah's power? No. Was it by Nehemiah's resources? No. It was the God of heaven. And because we are building with the God of heaven, anything is possible. And then they were able to say, we, his servants, will start rebuilding the wall. Are you ready to see some feedback on what God has been doing with charred stones? Last year, we didn't call it charred stones. We called it nothing except. Let's take a moment and watch this clip. Hello Church Alive family, Debs and myself want to take a moment to give you some feedback on Vision Offering 2022. If you recall, the theme for last year was nothing except, and it was based on the story of Elijah the prophet and the widow, and she had absolutely nothing. Except? Except. Some jars? She had some jars. They were empty, there was nothing in them, and Elijah said, bring them and let's see what God can do. And so. We spoke about five specific jars that we were trusting God for to fill for our house and our church uh, to create momentum for the vision God has given us. So shall we take a moment to go through those jars and see how we've been doing? We have seen God provide miraculously, just like he did with that widow, took her little bit of oil and multiplied it. We want to say a big thank you to mm. everybody who's partnered with us and who's given generously over and above your tithes. You've given into this vision offering and we've seen God supply so many exciting areas. The first jar represented our West Campus Church plant and we are so excited to say that we now have two thriving campuses, Church Alive North and Church Alive Absolutely West. Absolutely amazing. We've been functioning fully with yes. Sunday services, Kids Church, and we're seeing teens developing in that space as well. Congratulations to all those involved in the church plant. It's great to see our family growing. And then the second jar, obviously, was to purchase a property for our West plant, and that has been done. Uh, the church is on the property. Now we need to develop that property, and we've been talking to some architects and uh, some clever people in order to submit a site development plan and that in that way we can create momentum and fill up that jar. We've got a place, now we can develop it in the west and we've continued developing in the north. We've had an incredible partnership with a solar company who've in, installed solar power, not just in our offices, but also in the main building. So thank you to all those involved in that project. And we've been able to make sure that we're having uninterrupted services despite load shedding. We've also been able to build a pastoral care center yeah. where we have counseling in the week. Mm -hmm. um, and we've also been able to partner with VIT students who've done an internship there this year. And we're reaching the community with that pastoral care center. We've also continued with several other upgrades and maintenance to paint, expand our storage areas and brighten up the nurture zone. So thank you for your partnership with our continuing upgrades at the North Campus. And the fourth jar we call the tech jar. Um, we have been seeing incredible momentum in just the way we uh, increased our capacity to use online, to use technology and one of the things that we have seen that's been incredible is a three-year Kids Church curriculum that's completely and fully online, available to anybody out there who can use it and make use of it. And we continue to build uh, in that space, and it's incredible to see what is happening there. So yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And our Kids Church curriculum not only serves our kids, it includes many of our teens mm -hmm. as well, and it is really empowering the next generation to be effective in worshiping God and it's also free for other churches to use, which is an incredible opportunity to take the online space and make it a blessing to others, yes. and especially the next generation. Absolutely. And in the fifth jar, we were hoping to purchase the property next door mm. at the North Campus. And the property was on the market briefly, taken off the market. It's currently off the market, but we are continuing negotiations to be the first in line to put in an offer to purchase that property so that we can expand at our North Campus. 
And so we've seen God be faithful yes. in each of these five areas. Do you want to give the church the number of amount of money that came in as vision offering? Since we started the vision offering journey here at Church Alive, last year's number has been the biggest number we've seen on this journey. And I want to say thank you for your incredible generosity. In 2022, we contributed together as a family over 1.6 million rand into the Church Alive vision. That is absolutely phenomenal. It is amazing. And, and I think it ties in so beautifully with that widow scripture of yes. nothing except. Yes. Many people were feeling they had nothing mm -hmm. and they brought the little bit that they had. And yeah. God has multiplied it and filled up these jars so faithfully. And as we go into Vision 2023, we want to challenge you to have the courage of Nehemiah. Mm. Nehemiah went and he saw a huge project yes. which had great needs. Yeah. And if we look at our community around us, there's crisis and need in our community. But he knew that he wasn't doing it on his own. Mm. And we're not doing it on our own. That's right. And he says in Nehemiah 2 verse 20, he says, the God of heaven will help us yes. succeed. Yes. We, his servants, will start rebuilding the wall. And in their context, they were rebuilding a physical wall and we are building and rebuilding in our community, buildings as well as people. And I'm so excited about what God is going to do in Vision 2023. So won't you join us? Isn't that phenomenal? God is doing amazing, amazing things. And so as we come to the close of the service, I just want to give you a couple of practical ways and next steps of where we want to go. So you'll see in the book, in the center spread, we've got a couple of things that we've said are our goals for this next season. And I say season because I think this is bigger than a year. Um, this next season, we want to see God do a couple of things that are strategic for us. The first one is a new entrance foyer. You will have noticed that we haven't upgraded the front section because we are planning to do another entrance foyer that matches similar to the Legacy House entrance with the covered entrance. And uh, I nearly got into trouble because my son who's involved in youth ministry said, but where are the teens going to go? And so we'd like to start planning towards a new entrance foyer with an upstairs teens venue so that they can do teen church with separate to the kids. Do you think that would be helpful? Right? And then by moving the teens out of Legacy House, it will also create additional venue that we can grow our kids' ministry as well so that we can see Legacy House full of the next generation. So that's on a practical level. And then we'd still like to purchase the property next door when it comes on the market. In order for us to do so, we're going to need to build up some reserves so that we have the cash available when the property comes back on the market. And so we've put it up there. We don't have the funds for it for right now, and he doesn't want to sell it right now. And we're trusting that we'll have everything that we need when he's ready to sell so that we can expand at the Northcliffe campus. And then there's ongoing upgrades of facilities, our tech, our production. We want to make sure that our facilities are managed with excellence so that we can be a blessing. And, you know, sometimes when you look at a big project, ahead, you kind of think, wow, that's so big, that's so hard. Can I take a moment just to celebrate some previous successes that we've had? These are some of the previous projects when we were wanting to build um, the cafe. We did an upgrade on the cafe. They used to have windows. We knocked out the windows and we made them into doors. That's what it looked like in one season. You see it had that horrible face brick, right? And then this is what it looks like now. Aren't you glad we did that, right? So we want to do something even better for our new entrance when we do that in the future. Legacy House wasn't there two, 15 years ago. It wasn't there at all. And this is when we started building Legacy House. We actually did it in three phases. We first built the chapel, then we did the shell, and then this was the final phase as we were completing Legacy House. And what an amazing venue it is today. We've got an amazing facilities. Downstairs, we've got three venues. Upstairs, we've got two venues. They've got bathrooms, serving hatches, and we use that um, in, the, in the week as well for school and for other, other meeting venues as well. And that space is an incredible opportunity for our kids' church. Can we quickly jump ahead and get to the kids' pictures, and then I'll come back to our, our campus upgrade. There's the chapel. Um, so the chapel space we use for our primary school kids and weddings and funerals. Um, it's a beautiful space. We're planning some weddings with our marriage prep guys shortly. Then we've also got the 
Adventureland for the preschoolers, and then we've also got the playroom um, for our little toddlers, which is those spaces weren't there before. We have built that because we have a next-gen focus. Have a look at these pictures when we were doing the campus upgrade. We had to demolish a house, which is now where the parking lot is, and we had to rebuild and pave. That's the mess and the rubble that we went through, right? Not that long ago. And look at the beautiful facilities we have now. And when we see what God can do as we trust him faithfully step by step, we've got courage to know that he can do it again and he can help us continue to grow. And so now comes that moment. Some of you are excited, some of you are dreading it. I want to ask you to pick up that envelope and I want to pray together. If you've prepared something to give to, give an, to vision offering, now is your moment. If you brought cash, put it in the envelope. If you're wanting to give a pledge, you can take, pick up a pen and you can fill that in. It's got space if you want to pledge a certain amount for a certain amount of months. Um, and I want to challenge you, if you are going to do a pledge, to please do a debit order. What that does is it helps us to know exactly how to process that. And these you can pick up on your way out or you can collect one from me. I've got some in the front. And that is an amazing way to break it up over several months if you don't have a lump sum. If you haven't yet discussed it with your husband or wife, do not give away your life savings yet, okay? <laughs> if you haven't yet prepared, I want to ask you to take this home and pray over it, chat to, your, chat to your spouse and prepare something. And if you can bring it back next week or sometime during the month of November, and then we can calculate our vision offering and we'll be giving you feedback on that later. If you've brought normal tithes and offerings, please don't put it in this envelope. Please put it in our normal giving envelopes. They're available in the seat pockets so that we keep the two separate. We still need our normal tithes and offerings for the normal stuff we do. This is separate. This is specifically for vision. Has everybody got an envelope? Are you ready? I want you to hold it in your hands. Hold it in your hands. And let's pray for the vision that God has given us. Lord Jesus, as we symbolically hold this envelope... And it's a brown envelope. Lord, it makes me think of those charred stones. Nehemiah and his people looked at the broken down walls that had been burnt with fire. And the enemy whispered and shouted to say, what do you think you can build? You've got so little. But Lord, we know that when we bring it to you, the God of heaven will help us succeed. And Lord, as we give, whether it's cash, whether we're going to do an EFT, whether we're going to do a pledge, Lord, whatever it is, Lord, we bring it to you. We want to do it in partnership with you. We don't want to do it out of compulsion. We want to do it as directed by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we commit this to you and to your hands for your purposes. Lord, you've asked us the question, what is truly valuable? And Lord, the most valuable thing, Lord, we want to have a rich relationship with you. And we want to partner with you in your mission to make a difference in our world. Lord, as we bring our building and rebuilding vision offering this year, Lord, we pray that you'd bless it, multiply it, and that it would have a huge impact for your kingdom. We trust you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of you that are sitting on the sides, on either side and on the center aisle, if you would do me a favor, just reach under your seat and pick up the container. And then please, if you filled in your envelope, either filled it in or filled it with cash, put that in the, in, in the containers and the hospitality team will collect it for you. And if you want to do an electronic payment, we do also have snap scan options. You can scan on the envelope. Um, you can also go online to our online um, uh, options. And you can, if you're going to be doing an EFT, please would you clearly mark it with the reference vision. If it doesn't come through with a reference, we put it to normal tithes and offerings. But for your vision offering specifically, please do a separate um, reference for EFTs for vision offering. Thank you for partnering with us. And if you're going to take this home with you, put it somewhere where you can see it until you've filled it in and brought it back. Um, on your way out, there'll be some people that will have the debit order forms and the rebuild books. Make sure you've got one in your home. Refer to it throughout this series. Let's get the most that we can out of the sermon series, not just on the life of Nehemiah, but on how God works with people that are working for God's purposes. And we are going to see success just like Nehemiah did. Have you found today exciting?
Is it helpful? Together, as we partner with the God of heaven, He will help us succeed. And that is my prayer for you as you go today, that you will go with the help of the God of heaven and that He will help us succeed. Amen.